Welcome. Today is Thursday, April 13th, 2023, and I want to thank you for attending the 23 Myosha Trench Safety Standout event. My name is Jeremy Hidalgo. I am an Enforcement Supervisor with the Myosha Construction Safety and Health Division and will be the facilitator for today's event. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on our Myosha social media, including YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter shortly after today's event. In a few minutes, we will hear answers from industry professionals on common excavation questions. Hopefully, these upcoming questions and answers will provide clarity and further discussion at your job sites about working safely in excavations. Here's a quick fact regarding MIOSHA enforcement for excavations. Between 2018 and year to date, MIOSHA conducted 255 inspections of excavations including five fatalities. These inspections resulted in 248 serious citations, 21 repeat citations, and 107 other than serious citations with initial penalties totaling $706,540. This is a special OSHA Region 5 event to promote health and safety regarding excavation work activities. If you are not familiar with OSHA Region 5, it consists of the Great Lakes states, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Minnesota. Region 5 has uh, unfortunately experienced some incidents regarding trenching and excavations. We want to take this time today to spread the word about how to maintain regulatory compliance as construction work really kicks off in Michigan. You may think as an employer, we know what we are doing. This happens to other contractors out there. Why should we do a stand down event for trench safety? MIOSHA does proactive events like this to provide talking points for companies on safety and job site awareness because MIOSHA and other safety health and health professionals feel injuries and fatalities can be, be prevented. We know working in and around trenches continues to be a high hazard profession and we do not want anyone else killed or injured. Trench fatalities can happen on large industrial settings, commercial buildings, or even residential projects. Knowing how to protect employees working in excavations is important because most cave-ins have little or no warning signs. The odds of walking away and surviving a cave-in are slim. One cubic yard of dirt weighs approximately 3,000 pounds. Myosha and industry safety professionals, like those you of you participating today, continue to provide training and instructions to companies regarding compliance with Part 9, excavation, trenching, and shoring. This bit of information can lead to the recognition of a bad situation and save another person's life, or maybe even your own. Because of the nature of working in an excavation, it is imperative that companies provide training to their employees during all phases of the underground operation. Employers should provide multiple trenching methods to train their employees about trenching and excavation operations. Some training operations are classroom, internet, and on the job. Depending on the type of trench, employers could also choose alternative methods of non-excavating to complete the job. Two such methods are directional boring and cured in place pipe. Both options do not require an open excavation, thereby eliminating hazards to the employees. Employers who are performing excavation work should have at a minimum an accident prevention program, which is a safety program, with trench safety information. Also, if a support system is being used, the employer will need to have the design at the job site. However, companies that utilize best practices for trench safety typically also develop an emergency action plan. Some emergency action plan items include who the qualified person is, mist dig information, water removal scenarios, atmosphere testing, as well as entry and exit information. All employees should review the emergency action plan every day before work begins. Emergency action plan review, along with ongoing discussions, will assist on how to identify the proper safety equipment for each type of excavation and what to do if the proper equipment is not available. These measures will help eliminate unnecessary exposures, injuries, or possible fatalities. 
Keeping the pre-task discussion positive can be a good starting point for your next trench project. And by tracking what safety areas were missed should help reinforce the correct safety practices your company is striving to achieve. My OSHA consultation education, education and training consultants can provide further assistance for companies seeking compliance help. They would be happy to further explain excavations and training from this webinar and help you as the employer with your needs. Now, before I introduce the panel, I want to invite everyone watching to submit questions in the chat field throughout the presentation. We will likely not be able to get to all the questions today. So if you wish, please enter your question and a contact phone number. If we do not answer your question during the webinar, we will have someone from MyOSHA call you to discuss your question. Erica Funnel, CSHD supervisor, will be monitoring the chat and assisting with the online questions. So I would like to introduce our discussion panel. Uh, Tracy McLennan, uh, she is the Vice President of Operations from the Construction Association of Michigan. We have Greg Brooks. He is the Director of Safety and Compliance from the Michigan Infrastructure and Transportation Association. Spencer Telkamp. He is CEO from Dan's Excavating Services, Inc., representing Home Builders Association of Michigan. Chris Smith, Safety Director in Site Operations from First Companies, Inc., representing Associated Builders and Contractors of Michigan. Paul Rosinski, Director of Safety and Health from the Associated General Contractors of Michigan. And Eric Allen, Health and Safety Manager from Myosha Construction Safety and Health Division. All right, so I will get to the first question for today. And the first question is going to go to Spencer Telkamp. My company mainly does excavation work. What MIOSHA standards besides part nine apply to safety on excavation job sites? Good morning, everybody. Um, wanted to uh, thank everybody for having us on and hopefully you um, uh, this is beneficial. Um, we are Dan's excavating at a grant, not to be confused with the one over on the east side of the state, just to clarify that. Uh, to answer the question, um, there are many MIOSHA standards that would apply. Uh, I'll go through the ones that come to mind, but theoretically all of the MIOSHA standards can apply in different scenarios. Part one would apply general rules and accident prevention program or safety man manual is critical. Um, for the safety of the company, the uh, APP needs to inform the employees on various aspects. Also maintaining distances from electrical equipment, that's important. Uh, masonry part two, masonry wall bracing. Um, whenever you're in a trench uh, next to a, a wall or a masonry structure, we need to make sure that uh, we know what that, what that uh, wall or soil looks like because a, a trench cut too close to the wall, if it topples, can, can pin an employee or, or yourself. Part six comes to mind, having the proper uh, protective equipment, the PPE is really important um, and specific to different sites and different situations. Uh, part eight would be handling and storage of materials, rigging equipment, slings, um, just knowing the best way, safe way to move materials in conjunction with other people um, on that site. Uh, part 11 would apply uh, having fixed and portable ladders. Uh, ladders are critical to accessing the bottom of excavation trenches, um, but can also be in the way if they're not used correctly. So um, having the proper people on site who understand how to how to utilize those. Part 13, mobile equipment. Uh, depending what you have on site, you'll need fire extinguishers, ROPS, uh, backup alarms, um, and just an overall awareness of, of equipment um, that's being moved around on site. Part 15, excavators, hoists, elevators, helicopters, and conveyors. Most of the time you're you're working around uh, excavators, um, uh, digging that trench. You need to have an annual inspection paperwork, and um, MyOSHA likes to see that on site. Also, you need to have um, you need to be checking the, the equipment 
and the proper frequencies for maintenance. Part 22, signals, signs, tags, and barricades. If we establish a barrier or a barricade to keep people and workers away from the equipment or the excavation, that can help in safety measures with an open trench for sure. Uh, part 35, uh, confined spaces in construction. Um, storing and placing water or sewer equipment or pipe. Um, some of the structures can be really confined and tight and in some instances require a permit. Um, also being aware of different gases that might be in those basins, uh, depending on, on what type of um, sewer tie-in you're doing um, is important to know. Make, make sure you're, you have the proper PPE in, in that confined space as well. Uh, part 42, hazard communication. This standard applies to all job sites. Any chemical or material brought onto the job site needs a safety data sheet. And uh, last but not least, uh, part 45 would be fall protection. Uh, that's referenced in part nine. If we're crossing an excavation, uh, part 45 would also apply. And it has some specific rules specific to excavation and fall protection. All right, thank you for that answer, Spencer. Uh, the next question goes to Paul Rosinski. How do I locate underground utilities? Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. <clears throat> so as a review, part nine of the MIOSHA standard states that an employer shall not excavate without first, first having ascertained the location of all underground facilities of a public utility in the proposed area where the excavation is gonna take place. This includes any work in a street, highway, public place, a private easement of a public utility, or near the location of a public utility facility owned, maintained, or installed on a customer's premises. Miss Dig operates under Public Act 174. Miss Dig member utility owners are required to participate participate, excuse me, in a positive response program. This program uses an electronic ticket system for confirming the locations and marking has been completed. Excavators use this tool to verify that their ticket has been marked, is cleared, or identify any utilities that have not yet responded. Before any excavation work takes place in what's considered the caution zone, the excavator must expose all marked utilities by soft excavation methods prior to any power equipment being used. In the caution zone, that is parallel to, the, to a utility, exposing utilities at intervals as often as necessary, reasonably necessary to um, establish their precise location is required. The caution zone is defined as an area within 48 inches of either side of the utility's markings. Where there is, where there, where no other ev visible evidence exists, power equipment can be used in what's considered the safe zone. And the safe zone means an area 48 inches or more from either side of the utility markings. Finally, if an employer is excavating and is following the requirements established by Public Act 174, MIOSHA would consider them to be in compliance with the requirements of the rules in the section part, uh, part 9, 931.1 of their standards. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next question is gonna go to Brent Forsberg. What is a safe method to locate underground utilities and is using hydro vac equipment acceptable? Yeah. So we just heard about you know, using MISDIG and the importance of that, and we all understand, but you know, I'm sure everybody that's been in excavation long enough um, and Disclaimer, so I'm a, I'm on the development side and on the generally the team leadership side, not out in the trenches all the time. My father, grandfather and uncles and everybody were, so I heard the stories. And one thing to always remember is 
Mistig isn't perfect, right? Don't have that confidence there. So the important part when we're talking about safety is planning and making sure that we have that culture on site that we're always protecting our, our workers. We're making sure that we're using the the best uh, tools possible. You know, the question regarding the Hydrovac, I'm going to drop a um, a uh, reference from OSHA into the Q&A. So everybody should have that right now. And, you know, really, if you have questions, you've got resources here with my OSHA to be able to call and ask if there's ever any issues, you know, you can work with the utilities, make sure that those tickets are clear. You know, as far as the VAC truck itself, um, it is an acceptable method. Uh, you just have to make sure that it it's set to the uh, right settings so it's not pulling too hard out of the ground. You know, when you're looking at it and understanding uh, what you're doing, make sure that you have the right professionals if you're going to use that and are properly trained. You know, all of this comes down to training, awareness, and culture. And that's you know, what we talk about on our sites to make sure that people understand that at the end of the day, we want everybody to go home safe. We want everybody to come back tomorrow and have a positive working environment. You know, it's not about making it prescriptive per se. I mean, we have these rules in place to make sure that our job sites are safe. But if you don't build the culture and the why we do this behind it, you know, it's hard to get the buy in on the sites. But all of this at the end of the day, as we heard at the beginning, is to get people home safe, right? 3,000 pounds of material in one cubic yard. You know, it's it's dangerous and inherently and, and trenches are one of the most dangerous pieces of job site of the job site. Um, you know, the death rates higher when there is an accident, so it needs that extra level of caution. And for our residential guys that are on here, I just want to make sure that everybody realizes once you pour a foundation, you now have a trench uh, generally, you know, because it's going to be more than five foot deep. And you have that area and people sometimes don't think twice about jumping in between that for a minute. Oh, I dropped something down in there. I mean, extreme caution has to be taken when we're on these sites and understanding that awareness that once we make a change, once we pour a, pour a wall, once we start digging and putting down the, our materials, that we are creating an environment that could be unsafe. So that's the thing, uh, you know, use the tools that are out there. This uh, OSHA website, that I put in has a lot of clarification on different rules that you can go to and do searches where people have asked questions and they've made interpretations. And these go back, I think, to the at least 20 years worth of data on there. And you know, rules might have changed from when that came out. So you use it with a grain of salt, but understand that that the tools are out there and it's always ask questions and always make sure that on site you're working with your team to explain the why these are so important and why these rules need to be followed. Thank you, Brent. The next question is going to go to Greg Brooks. How do I properly inspect an excavation? Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, good morning, Jeremy. Thank you very much. It's a great question. Uh, and it's a question that it requires kind of a three-part answer first of all who does the inspections when to do the inspections and then and then what to actually inspect uh, as far as uh, who does the inspection every excavation is required to have a designated qualified person on site and that designated qualified person is the person responsible for doing these inspections um, when it comes to when to do the inspections uh, my OSHA uh, my OSHA standards require an ongoing inspection to be done. So like, what does ongoing mean? Basically, when, you know, whenever an employee is going to enter the end of excavation uh, before every shift, uh, anytime we have a rainstorm or any other hazard producing condition changes, uh, an inspection is going to be, or anytime we have a condition change, going to require an inspection. Um, one that often gets over, overlooked is whenever we enter a different soil type, it's going to require an inspection also. Uh, as far as how to inspect the, in an excavation, uh, first of all, you, know, you want to check the, the surface area. Uh, you want to look there, a couple or several things that you want to consider there. Uh, take a look at the surface conditions, ensure that there's no cracks around the indication or around the excavation indicating that that there's uh, that the excavation's breaking away. Uh, take a look, make sure your spoil piles are at least two feet away from the, the edge of the excavation. 
make sure your materials and tools are all far enough away from the edge of the excavation that they're not going to roll into the excavation on top of somebody that's in there. Uh, you want to make sure that there's nothing around the excavation that's going to cause a vibration. Obviously, vibrations can be very detrimental it, around an excavation. Uh, after you take a look at the surface area, the qualified person's going to want to check the banks of the side of the excavation, uh, check for cracks, uh, check for you know falling dirt that indicates weaknesses in the in the excavation. Um, if you're using shore, shoring or shielding, you want to double check that your shoring or shielding is still in place and effective. Uh, you want to check the hydraulic cylinders, make sure that they're intact, that they're not leaking. Uh, you want to make sure your wedges of all are all remaining tight. And then lastly, uh, you want to take a look at your access, your access and egress, your ingress egress. Uh, make sure that that is in place and close enough to the employees that are in the excavation. Thank you, Greg. The next question will go to Eric Allen. How big does my trench box need to be? Good, good morning, everyone. Um, so not every trench box is going to fit every situation. So just from the production side of things, making sure you have the appropriate trench box, you need to make sure that you can do the work. But the most critical part is, can you do the work safely? And you have to be able to do both those functions, performing the work and performing it safely. So from the standard side, uh, if you look at rule 942.1, it talks about the angle of repose and the design of the support system for the side of excavation shall be based on an evaluation and it goes, gets into these different factors. And there's five different factors, the depth of the cut, the type of the soil, the possible variation in the water content of the material while the excavation is open, anticipated changes in the material due to exposure to air, sun, water, or freezing, load imposed by structures, equipment, overlying material, or stored material. And then lastly, vibration from traffic, equipment, or blasting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down each of these pieces here. Depth and cut of the soil. Uh, you do not want a trench box where the material can overflow. Um, not super familiar with this happening very often. That, thank goodness it doesn't happen, but you could run into a situation if it's too small that the material can fall over the top onto workers below. Or if you have enough, uh, space on the sides, you don't want it to be able to collapse if there is a collapse on the sides and then still infiltrate the openings in the trench box. Also, the next portion is possible variation in the water content of the material. Uh, is there even a potential for water to come into that excavation? That's a really important key when you're planning the job site uh, because the saturation of that soil and the working conditions can really change the, the dynamic of what type of trench box you need. Uh, water is pretty heavy and then that poses a lot more um, forces on that trench box. You need to make sure that trench box is big enough, sturdy enough, strong enough, designed strong enough to make sure that it can impose in both types of conditions. Anticipated changes in the material due to exposure to air, sun, water, freezing. We all live in Michigan. We're familiar with all these different things. Uh, the ground moves and we need to be aware of that. So there's the heat in the summer, the freeze in the winter, water table level. Right now it's spring, so we're getting some warmer weather, we're getting some colder weather, and depending where you're at, you may still have snow. So the, the ground is continuously moving and you need to make sure that those anticipated changes are uh, being realized. So oversizing the box is typically a safer bet uh, because the ongoing person, the ongoing inspection with a qualified person is really critical in this, this aspect as well, because they can always say, we need to stop, get a different size trench box out here because of what I'm seeing. Next, we have load imposed by structures, equipment, overlying material, or stored material. So spoils should be back two feet. Um, but there's always sideways forces that are being imposed, even with the spoils that are set backwards or back always. Um, so that's still pushing down on your excavation. And then structures and equipment also pose forces, and those rules can be found in 953. And that typically is a lot more engineering behind that if there is a, a structure for underpinning and potential undermining of actual buildings as well. The last piece is vibration from traffic equipment or blasting. So traffic, most of the time, you're not gonna have it directly next to traffic. There are situations where it does happen. The vibration just from the road itself needs to be protected against for the workers. The equipment also, if you've been around any type of heavy machinery, there's still a vibration to it, that piece of equipment running. So that needs to be part in, 
part of the factor. And then lastly is blasting. We don't see a lot of blasting, but that obviously does shake up the earth around uh, where people could be working in excavation, so they need to be protected. Some of the other considerations uh, need to be accounted for when you're choosing a box. Uh, uh, could be that it's a rectangle, and uh, unfortunately a lot of people forget about the two open sides of the excavation. You need to actually have protection on both ends, uh, depending on the situation. Sometimes if you're uh, laying pipe, you'll have it buttered up all the way, and they, they forget to, that there's a sheer wall on one end, and they need to be protected. So these are some of the considerations you need to think about when you're choosing the right size box. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that will help uh, you determine these factors, but then also they can also rent them or sell these boxes to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Next question will go to Tracy McLennan. Who determines a qualified person? You are muted. Hi, good morning. Um, so you've heard the term qualified person thrown around a couple different times already in answering these questions. And according to the definition in part nine, a qualified person means a person who by possession of a recognized degree or certificate of professional standing, or who by extensive knowledge, training and experience has successfully demonstrated the ability to solve or resolve problems relating to the subject matter and work. So as that relates to excavations, it basically means that the employer is ultimately responsible for identifying that qualified person. And they would do that by ba two basic criteria. The first is, has the individual received training specific to the equipment or task involved? So we have competent person training. Um, there's typically full day classes. Sometimes they're two day classes, depending on how uh, in depth the information is going to get. But ultimately, if an employer sends an employee to one of these classes, the next question they need to evaluate is, can the individual now demonstrate the skills and knowledge to solve or resolve the problems specific to the subject or work? So they attended the class, they got the certificate, but the employer has to make sure that they learned and that they can apply their learning and knowledge to the task at hand. In some cases, a degree or certification may be required. In other cases, it can be a combination <clears throat> of tenure and training. So you may have one qualified individual that's gonna design your support system, and you might have an entirely different qualified individual responsible for ongoing inspections of the excavation. So there could be a team required, depending on the knowledge and the skills and the type of work involved that are all designated qualified individuals, but for specific tasks related to the type of work that's being done. So again, just to, to uh, summarize that, it's, it's incumbent upon the employer to determine who their qualified person is and what skill set they have that makes them uh, qualified for that specific task. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, the next question is going to go to Brent Forsberg. I've heard of the 245 rules. What are those rules? Thank you. When we talk about 245, um, you know, it's one of these things that can just help promote for the workers on site to remember as they approach a trench of, of what are the rules for trench safety. And building on what Greg said when he was talking about inspections, you know, the two feet is making sure that two feet from the excavation, there's no tools, there's nothing piled up there that could either A, roll in or put weight on the edge of that trench that could cause a cave-in. And then four feet, when we're at four feet, we need a ladder and we heard about that too and, and making sure that the ladder is placed properly so it's not impeding the work in the trench, but it is providing the safe safety. And one thing to keep in mind is that ladder should extend about three feet up above the trench to make it for safe access in and out. And then five foot, if you go over five foot, uh, you got to you gotta shore it or shield it. I mean, it, it, this is so important because you're getting to the depth now that uh, uh, the, these get really dangerous. And, you know, no matter what, it's, it's hard because people, you know, on a job site, things are moving. Oh, just got to go in there for a second. And this is where having that in place and having that culture in place and that understanding that these are the rules and using these uh, tools and reminding people daily, two, four, five, stay alive, can help kind of build that. So as they're approaching the trench, that awareness is getting built um, 
every day and that they are beginning to understand and, and it just becomes part of of their their operations on site. I put a. Um, should go now here. So there's a link to a video. Uh, I love YouTube. You can find pretty much everything you know on the internet. Um, this was a great video from a company that built for their employees. They posted it publicly so other companies can use it. If this one doesn't match uh, your company's culture, I, I just pulled it up this morning and on the side there's about a dozen more from different companies all ranging from two to five minutes long that just help reinforce and build what this means and, and building that culture on the site. So, you know, two feet, nothing on the uh, nothing on the edge of the trench. Four feet, got to have a ladder. Five feet, got to shore it or shield it. And those, you know, those are the basic simple rules. I mean, this is why you have your inspectors and qualified people on site that take it further. But this is just that reminder for your guys and, and workers on site that these are, um, these are the basic rules to to make sure that they're going to go home safe at the end of the day. Thank you, Brent. The next question is going to go to Greg Brooks. Is water allowed to be present in an excavation while employees are inside? Uh, great question. Uh, and it's a real simple, straightforward answer. No, uh, but yeah, obviously, no doesn't make for a very good webinar answer. So I'll uh, I'll just kind of expound on it a little bit and read you what Part Nine, Rule Nine Thirty Two, uh, Paragraphs Two and Three in the uh, MIOSHA standards say: uh, An employee shall not work in an excavation in which there is accumulated water in which water is accumulating, unless uh, certain precautions have, ta have been taken to protect employees against the hazard posed by water accumulations. Uh, the precautions necessary to protect the employees adequately vary uh, vary with each situation, but may include special support systems, uh, shielding systems to protect from cave-ins, or uh, water removal systems to control the level of accumulating water, uh, or using a, a, excuse me, a, a safety harness or a lifeline. Uh, and then just kind of a side note on that, because it does go further if you're using a water removal system. Um, if a water control or if water is controlled or prevented from accumulating by the use of water removal equipment, the water removal equipment operations shall be monitored by that, as we've established, our, that very busy qualified person uh, or, a or a monitoring system to ensure that the equipment keeps running and runs properly. Thank you, Greg. Uh, the next question is going to go back to Paul Rosinski. How does MIOSHA classify soils and is it different from OSHA? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, MIOSHA, the MIOSHA regulation contains what's con uh, what they identify as table one for the angle of repose or sloping based on the soil conditions. <clears throat> this table uses the unconfined compressive strength as measured with a pentrometer and also provides a description of the soil's types and consistencies. Federal OSHA does it a little different. They separate soils into categories A, B, and C. But both MyOSHA and OSHA also provide examples of the types of soils. MyOSHA provides information on soil types and the definitions in their regulation as well. Other things um, that would be considered in classifying soil, much like Eric spoke to, are things like water content. <clears throat> Has it been previously excavated? Are there other utilities that are present or nearby? Are there obstructions or any other weight that's being put on the side of that excavation? intersecting areas that, of, that you may come across where it has been previously excavated as well, and the length of time that the excavation has been, been exposed to environmental elements, wet, dry, frost, freeze. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next question is gonna go to Spencer Telkamp. How do we determine soil classification? What means can we use? Uh, one of the first things when we look at a project, um, even during the you know the estimating stage, is is you you want to know the, the soil type. And 
so when we when we think about safety of that soil type uh there's a, a couple different ways there's a pocket uh penetrometer and pen, penetrometers are a direct reading spring operated instrument uh, used to determine the soil uh, unconfined compressed strength of uh, saturated cohesive soils once pushed into the soil an indicator sleeve displays the reading most of these instruments are calibrated in tons per square foot uh, it reads a dry strength dry soil that that crumbles freely with moderate pressure into individual grains is granular, dry soil that falls into clumps and uh, break into smaller clumps and smaller clumps can be broken only with difficulty is probably clay, um, can have some silt or gravel uh, mixed in with some sand and that too. Um, and a lot of times a, a visual inspection when you when you actually open that trench up um, is, I mean, it's kind of an obvious thing to, to a certain degree, but it kind of goes back to having that um, qualified person on site, somebody uh, watching that trench um, for the cracking and um, just using that that visual test. Um, in a visual test, the entire excavation of the site is observed, um, including the soil adjacent to the site, the soil being excavated. Um, and that typically is done by that project manager, or that qualified person um, with the knowledge that to, to know what to look for. Um, you kind of look for uh, plasticity or a wet thread. This test is conducted by molding a moist sample of soil into a ball and attempting to roll it into a, a thin thread approximately eighth inch in diameter thick by two inches in length. The soil sample is held by one hand. If the end does not break or tail tear, the soil is considered cohesive. A shear vein to determine an unconfined comprehensive strength of soil with a shear vein Tiny blades of the vein are pressured into a level section of undisturbed soil. And then the knob is slowly turned until soil failure occurs. And then there's laboratory tests and soil boring reports. Um, oftentimes the engineering report um, has uh, the, the methods that have the blow counts or the drilling methods included in that. Um, Overall, with different soil types and testing measures, you need to make sure there's an ongoing inspection of an excavation trench being made by a qualified person. Using more than one of these methods is important. Parts of the job may have different soil types and angle of repose uh, will need to be changed accordingly. And um, I believe in part nine, there's a great graph that shows what that what that slope and what that cutback should look like. Um, so it's up to a MIOSHA standard. Also, the qualified person can also determine that based on the soil conditions, even though if the soil type is is X, um, we're going to cut back further um, than even required just based on that that experience. Um, so we have a safe trench. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, the next question is going to go to Eric Allen. Do I need fall protection while working around excavations? Okay, I just want to thank uh, Spencer. One of his answers previously did talk about this uh, real briefly, so I'm glad to open up uh, upon this. So there's a few aspects to this. In Part 9, Rule uh, 951.2 talks about that, and that's when an employee has to is required or permitted to cross a trench, ditch, walkway. Um, at that point, you'll have to have a, um, a ramp or runway that goes across. It's not less than three times the imposed load, and it does have to have a guardrail as, as well in compliance with part 45 so out of part nine we're seeing uh, a situation where if you do have to cross it you do need to have a uh, form of fall protection meaning the guardrails so that's directly in part nine also in part 45 fall protection there is a specific section regarding excavations as well and if you go to 1926.501 b as in boy seven uh, i'm going to read the two sections that relate to this is uh, relate to this is each employee at the edge of an excavation six feet or more in depth shall be protected from falling by guardrail systems, fences, or barricades when the in an excavation are not readily seen because of plant growth or other visual barrier. And then Roman numeral two is each employee at the edge of a well, pit, shaft, and similar excavation six feet or more in depth shall be protected from falling by guardrail systems, fences, barricades, or covers. 
So if you have one of these situations, then yes, you would need to have fall protection around that excavation. Thank you, Eric. Um, the next question is going to go to Tracy. Uh, why do I need a design for my trench box? How do I comply? So when choosing your support system for an excavation, you have a few options, but the most common are usually trench boxes or sheet piling with braced supports. And why do you need a design can be answered um, simply, I think Jeremy pointed out at the beginning that a cubic yard of soil can weigh more than 3,000 pounds. So choosing your support system is the first step, but also considering all those other factors on the job site, including the soil conditions, the water in the area, uh, the weather, the load on the top side, as well as vibration in the area, are all going to impact which one you choose when you make your decision about protecting your workers. So not every option is able to fit every scenario. And just because a trench box fits in the excavation doesn't mean it's the best choice for withstanding the forces imposed upon it. If you do the same type of excav excavating operation day in and day out, you probably have a system that works for your company, but the design behind it is very important. You and the safety of your workers are relying on that design. All support systems must be designed by a qualified person, and in most cases a construction engineer, and the design is required to be on the job site. When workers encounter a situation where they need to move the braces because there's an obstruction like pipe interference, there, that's a good opportunity to make sure that the trench box or the selected support system is designed to have those braces removed. The amount of force imposed on the sides of an excavation is incredible, and only a qualified person can approve those changes. The qualified person making that decision needs to consult the design to see what is possible for alterations, if any. Some trench boxes, boxes you, you can't remove the supports. If you have a trench box where you can move the braces, you need to make sure you're working within the manufacturer's guidelines and or the qualified person's design. Also, keep in mind that trench boxes take a lot of abuse. Making sure that the box is still capable of withstanding the forces is critically important. There are limitations to everything, and trench boxes are built for rough conditions, but when the braces have been pulled by excavators, accidentally struck by materials, set in and out of excavations uh, repeatedly, this wear and tear degrades the strength of each component of the trench box. Every employer must check the design of their trench boxes or support systems, and you may realize that the application you're using is not what it's designed for. So I am also going to put a link into the Q&A to a lesson um, that, require, that includes all of the mathematical calculations that you would use to design your support system and make sure that it's going to work within the parameters of the excavation. Thank you. Well, that did conclude the questions uh, for the day. Uh, I just want to thank all the panelists for answering those questions. I do appreciate that. Um, so at this time, I wanted to ask Erica. Erica, were there any questions uh, placed in the chat? No, there are no questions. Okay. All right. So, well, I will go down to the closing part. So as we conclude today, uh, I would like again to thank all of our panelists for sharing their knowledge and the time that they have dedicated to providing answers to these excavation questions. Also, I want to thank our viewers. We appreciate that you took time out of your day to listen to this important topic. Going forward, you can find more information about MIOSHA's Excavation Emphasis Program. Uh, that uh, program website will be included in the Q&A section for everyone to see. Erica will be able to put that there shortly. Um, at the website, you will also be able to find helpful information about excavation safety, as well as a link to today's program. Also, please remember, MIOSHA is available to provide training and resources to all contractors who would like assistance. Please contact MIOSHA CET division with any questions, training needs, or to schedule Michigan Training Institute courses. The phone number to MIOSHA CET is 517-284-7720. The MIOSHA Construction Safety and Health Division is also available to answer related questions. Thank you for everyone who participated, participated today. Remember to slope it, shore it, shield it. Thank you. Have a good day.